hello uh, hello and welcome everyone to the 26th session of the data science webinar series being organized by the manav science manav data science webinar series by the manav human atlas initiative myself dr anup maharshal will be the moderator for your session today the webinar today will be addressed by dr kavita jain who is a professor at the jawaharlal nehru center for advanced scientific research she is a theoretical physicist uh, by training having completed her phd from tifr and her postdoctoral fellowship from university of cologne germany and weizmann institute of science israel her research interests include statistical physics and evolutionary biology her talk today is going to be on i'm sorry uh, evolution is responsible for the great diversity we see today on earth while the role of natural selection is widely known it is not appreciated that evolution is for most part a random process random events such as mutations reproduction in small populations and fluctuating environments play a key role in shaping the evolution trajectories in her talk today she will discuss some classic experiments that demonstrate the randomness in evolution its consequences and discussing the building of stochastic models to understand evolutionary dynamics now before we proceed for the talk a few instructions for all the attendants who are present today the session or the presentation will last for about 30 to 45 minutes which will be followed by a question answer session that will last for about 10 to 15 minutes we would request to all those who are attending the session on all the uh, platforms to kindly put on the questions in the question and answer mode in the tab that is provided below please do remember that all the questions will be taken at the end of the session thank you and over to you dr kavita thanks thank you anupma for the kind introduction and i would also like to thank dr preeti uh, for inviting me and gayatri uh, for making all the arrangements and rest of the manav team who is working behind the scenes to make this initiative a success okay so um i'll just share the screen and just let me know if you can see is it visible yes ma'am good okay. to go yeah okay good so thank you um so this mini my something yeah okay so um as anupma already said that i'm going to speak about randomness in biological evolution uh so so all of you have some idea about evolution what evolution is and what is this randomness that i'm talking about so i would like to uh, you know describe that in next uh, 30 minutes um so we often hear about natural selection and mutation in the context of evolution but randomness is something which is there but somehow you know it's not discussed or it is not uh, you know uh, appreciated so i hope i can convey to you the importance of being random in especially in the context of evolution so before i come to randomness let me first tell you what evolution is so i hope i mean i'm sure you all have read something about evolution in school or college but let me still say something about it so if you look around yourself you will see that there is a lot of variation in the population around you so you could look at in the human population you could look at your favorite flower or animal and then you will see that you know there is there are all these individuals in a population that they are different from each other you can of course look at them and say that they are variation they are different but they are also different at the genetic level which of course you cannot see but i mean uh, you should realize that there is a variation at both what you can look at which is called the phenotype as well as at the genetic level now the idea about the evolution is that this variation that you see in a population some of it is heritable that means it can be passed on from one generation to another and if these variants they happen to be good for the population in the particular environment then those variants will be selected for that is the population would have tendency to keep passing them and that kind of variant that mutant would tend to spread so let me repeat this in darwin's words he says that natural selection is scrutinizing the slightest heritable variations rejecting that which is bad preserving and adding up all that is good but then he goes on to say 
that we see nothing of these slow changes in progress. We only see that the forms of life are now different from what they formerly were. That is, he's pointing to the fact that the evolution is such a slow process, it, its pace is so slow that we cannot actually see this phenomenon, okay? And that's of course true. I mean, we don't, uh, you know, uh, some of the processes that happen, they happen over the years, many millions of years, right? We cannot see that. However, there are examples and there are numerous examples, in fact, where we can see evolution in action. And I will start with one example that all of you have read in your school or college. And this is the classic story of the peppered moth. So as you all again know from school, that there are these two varieties of these two peppered moths in Europe. And this is a story which you know, started in UK, in England. So the story is that before the industrial revolution, there are these two types of moths, the black pepper one, which you can see over here, and the white pepper one, it's in the red circle. And you cannot see it very well because very nicely camouflaged. So the idea was that you know, before the industrial revolution, these tree trunks, they are covered with lichen because of which the light colored moth is nicely camouflaged, whereas the dark one is visible to the predators, which are bats or the birds. And as a result, this will get eaten up preferentially compared to the light colored moth. And therefore the frequency of the dark colored moth will be much smaller, not zero, but much smaller than the light one. <clears throat> but then because of industrial revolution, there was a pollution and these trees got covered in soot. And there's a reversal of fortune in the sense that now the dark colored moth has an advantage. Now it is less visible to the predators compared to light colored moths. And then its frequency increased all from 10% over here to almost 90%. And then in the 1950s, back to this original picture, that is uh, because of the, you know, uh, uh, there was a Clean Air Act in UK because of which, you know, it was made um, as to, you know, um, take care of the pollution. And again, these trees started to get lichen the suit and all disappeared. So therefore these light colored moths, their frequency increased and that of dark colored moths decreased. So that's a story that you all know from school. And the key point that I want to make here from this slide is that these changes, these huge changes in the frequency of let's say the black pepper moth from 10% to 90% back to 10%, they happened in the, a short span, something like 50 years or so. These large changes in the frequency. So that's one classical example of evolution in action. You can observe evolution. And it's a very nice story. So you see uh, this uh, point about, uh, you know, so, so I said to you in, in the first slide that there is variation in the population. So we saw that these two variants, the black one and the dark one, and there is heritability and the selection. But what's the agent of selection? So that birds are the ones which are driving this. That means these are the ecological force, if you like because of which selection is happening, there's more prediction for one than the other. The one which is less camouflage and there's more prediction. So that will actually remain a hypothesis for a very long time. And there were experiments done and you know, some people were skeptical, others were not and so on. But experiments were done after a long time in the 50s first. These experiments, however, have been criticized for not being designed well or not being very careful. And then they were repeated later on in the 2000 Vermeerus. And uh, basically the idea of these experiments is that you release a bunch of moths. You count the number of moths in the morning, uh, okay, hundreds of them, or, or rather in the night, that how many moths you have, you release them in the night, they will settle down in the trunks, tree trunks or the branches of the tree and so on. And then you just leave them there for some time and then recapture them. That means you collect them back. And if there's a reduction in number, then the hypothesis uh, uh, then the answer is consistent with the fact that birds have eaten them up. In fact, these experiments were so carefully done by Mavedus that they were, he actually saw them being eaten by the birds. So these are very carefully done experiments and so on. And this is the data that, uh, uh, you know, Mavedus passed away before he could publish his results, but these are the results that his colleagues published later on. So as you can see here, because these experiments were done in the 2000s, uh, when there is no more pollution. So now woods are light, meaning you know the trees are light colored. So therefore the dark moths are the ones which are at a selective disadvantage. So now the dark moths are going to be eaten up more by the birds than the light colored ones. So the results of the experiment are shown here that the fraction surviving of the light moths is more than the dark moths. 
and this selection against the dark moths, it's about 10%. And that by you know, evolutionary standards is pretty high. It's a huge selective pressure. So when I said that sometimes you can watch evolution in action is typically the ones when selection pressure is high. And that's sort of consistent with this number. The second point I want to make by showing you this one number is that people are interested in understanding evolution, not just qualitatively, the kind of story that you read in school, but quantitatively. We want to put numbers, we want to understand these trends, what can we predict, what is this point one, how can we, can we understand this number, etc. Okay, okay. So uh, this is the experiment and it is about the color of the moth. But as I said earlier, that variations are heritable. So as you know, these are controlled by therefore the DNA or the genome of the organism. So therefore one can ask, what are the underlying genetics? Which part of the genome or which mutation or, you know, is controlling, which gene is controlling the color of the moth? They must be different in their genome. It has been known for more than 100 years that these, the color is different just because of a single change in the genome, but exactly which gene is responsible, that was found only very recently. Okay, so I mean, I, I, I like this story very much because it's very nice and simple, and it's a clear example of evolution in action. There are experiments, there is some theory, there are understanding of what happens at the phenotypic level. Phenotypic here means is the color of the moth what happens at the genetic level. And, you know, if you read this story, I mean, there is a book and uh, there are papers, etc., review papers. If you read this story, it's very nice because there were some controversies and so on. There are lots of ups and downs, quite Hollywoodian sort of thing. And, uh, you know, if you get a chance, I strongly recommend you to uh, read more about it. Okay, so this was a story of moth, which you have read in school, but let me now tell you about one more experiment. And this time, um, this experiment is on microbes. These are the E. coli experiments. E. coli. And this is E. coli because they replicate much faster, like about in 20 minutes, compared to the moths, which takes several months. So this is a classical experiment which was started in 1988, and it's still going on to this day. So the idea about this experiment is just to take the E. coli with the same ancestor and put them in these 12 different flasks. And you know, uh, they are, these colonies are allowed to grow, but they are given less food than they are used to. So the glucose given to them is lesser. So this population is therefore starving. It is maladapted, and, uh, you know, adapt so that it's, uh, it, it can, you know, in the new surrounding, it can change, it can adapt. Mm -hmm. And if it does, if it does survive, then its fitness would increase with time. And so that's what is shown here. The fitness increased with time, and uh, you see that this fitness increased about 40% in the first 5,000 generations or so, and then this increase slowed down quite a lot. It increased only by 20% in the next uh, 45,000 generations. I mean, the experiment is still going on, actually, and it's a very slow run. But we would like to understand why is this, you know, what, how do we understand this curve? What, what, what's going on? Why did it increase faster, and why is it slow, and so on? Not just fitness. So this is the fitness averaged over these 12 populations, not just that. We know a lot more, a lot more things can be find, found experimentally. So I just show a very tiny snapshot of the results from this experiment. So this is a very complicated looking stuff. And what is shown here is the frequency of mutants as a function of time. So here, a mutant came out ground and, you know, it somehow swam through the population. That means it had a very low frequency and it just spread to the population. Then maybe another mutant came, the blue one, it increased, decreased, increased, and so on. And there are lots of stuff going on here. This is a very complicated story, so we will not go into that today. But I would like to use this to point out to you that there are a lot of experiments. There is... And people want to go also beyond just the qualitative verbal explanations to quantitative modeling. They want to understand what's happening. Can we understand this? Can you put numbers about it? Can you make predictions and so on? 
Okay, so uh, the previous slide that I showed you, they uh, pose some questions. So there are, of course, a lot of questions, but let me just pose three of them to you. One question, obvious from the last slide, is what are the dynamics of these mutant frequencies? What evolutionary forces are determining them? What kind of evolutionary forces are there because of which something grows, uh, it does not grow, or it grows a little bit and falls down back and so on? Can we understand that? The frequencies that I showed you are at the genetic level. How does that connect with the phenotype, that is the color of the moth? So if something is happening at the gene frequency, which I showed you, I told you that there is a gene which is responsible for the color. If something happens over there, how does it translate? And what does it do to the color of the moth? How does the frequency, the phenotype change with time? Another question is, how do we find out which of these sites in the genome are under selection? Which uh, are there techniques for that? So this is more of a genomics question, but uh, you know, I probably will not be able to say anything about it, much about it. But these are some of the questions that we would like to address. And in my group, we are interested in addressing all of these questions. Okay. So today, however, I will focus only on the first question. Okay. So my question is simply is how does the frequency of the new variant change with time? So we are going back to UK in the pre-industrial revolution era, and just one moth, the dark colored moth appeared. So most of the population was light colored moths, and there were just a few of these dark colored moths. Dark -colored moths. And we're trying to address, we're trying to ask this question, how does its frequency or the number change with time? So you can think about it yourself, because what do you expect? You expect that, you know, we just said that this predator, it is less visible to the predator in the pre-industrial revolution era, Oh, sorry, uh, I mean, after revolution, industrial revolution. So it's less visible to predator because sitting on these suited trees, right? So it must be a good mutation. And if it's a good mutation, you expect from natural selection that its frequency should increase with time. And so you can cook up a simple theory, and that's what it shows that initially this mutant is in small numbers, maybe two, three, four, five of them, and its frequency increases with time, right? And uh, if this mutation spreads through the entire population, then of course, you know, it will saturate at some point. How does this increase? This increases exponentially fast. I'm sure you're reading it in newspapers, right? Number of cases are increasing exponentially or the number of, uh, you know, the viruses are increasing exponentially. So it's a very fast rise initially, and then it sort of saturates. Similarly, the wild type, which in this case is the light colored moth, its number would decrease exponentially towards zero. So this is something you expect intuitively. However, there's a problem with this plot. You see, I started about 180 or 190 of these uh, light colored moths, and it decreased to about 10, 20 of them in 600 generations. But it's been almost 1,000 generations, about another 400 generations, and number is still non-zero. In fact, if you write down the simple equations underlying this, you will find that it takes forever for this moth, for this frequency to become zero. For the extinction to happen completely, it takes forever. Now, if you think about it, that does not make sense. How can a finite population take infinite time? There are only a finite you know, um, number of people to which things have to be spread. How can it take forever? Right? So it points to a problem in the usual standard theories. And the reason is that this theory is incorrect when a population is small. It's the population when it's going near extinction, its numbers have become very small, then this theory called a deterministic theory, don't worry too much about it if you don't know what that means, but these are sort of simple-minded theories, they are incorrect when the size of the population is small. By the same token, this theory is also incorrect when the new variant arises. So you are hearing a lot about these new variants coming of the coronavirus, right? 
So, but when they come in, when they just arise, they're very small in number, right? So, if I try to if I try to understand them using these simple minded theories, it's likely to be incorrect. So, what do we do? So, what is this all this smallness business going on? What has had to do with these theories being wrong? So, what is the connection of the smallness of the population? Okay. So, let's digress a bit. I just do something very, very simple that all of us can do at home. So there are about 100 of you. Let's say 50 of us take a coin. And it's a fair coin. That means the chance of getting ahead or tail is equal to one half. Let's toss this coin 100 times. So the first thing perhaps you would think of is that if I, if I toss this 100 times, I should get uh, 50 heads and 50 tails, right? So one of you did this experiment and he or she found that, oops, I did not get 50 uh, heads. I got maybe uh, 45 heads. Another one of you did and you know, somebody got 60 heads. Somebody got exactly 50 heads, right? So this is something you can do and you are familiar with this sort of thing that the number of heads that you're going to get is not going to be exactly 50. In fact, there was going to be fluctuations in this number. And these fluctuations are however, going to be small. So there's a 50 plus minus 10 around that. Okay. So this is when you toss the coin 100 times. If you were to toss this coin only 10 times, then you would find that sometimes you get all heads or all tails or three heads for, or, two, two, or, or just two heads. So the fluctuations relative to the five so it's five plus minus three, four. These fluctuations are large when I toss the coin small number of times. So the key point here is that there is stochasticity when I am dealing with small numbers. This is a coin tossing experiment. What has that to do with evolution? Some of these concepts actually go through when we think of evolution as well. So let's go back to evolution now. So the idea that there is randomness plays an important role. This, this is, you know, started almost a century back and it's from a simple observation that organisms usually produce many more offspring that can actually be sustained in the environment because each environment has a finite carrying capacity. So for example, Drosophila, it lays hundreds of eggs. If all hundreds of eggs of each Drosophila were to survive, it's simply not possible. There's not food for all of them. So even if all the parents of the, all Drosophila parents are equally fit, if all the offspring are equally fit, yet most of those offspring will have to die. That death is not because they're less fit. There's no selection there. It's just by chance. It's this kind of randomness that I'm talking about in this talk. So just to illustrate this point again, suppose I have a bunch of parents here, three reds and this four, uh, uh, four sorry, three uh, squares and four circles because of production, maybe let's say each of them produces two offspring. But like I said, there's a finite carrying capacity. Then some of them have, they have to die. So maybe nature, if you like, uh, tosses a coin and decides to oh, survive, die and so on. So that, at the end, at the next generation, you don't have three squares, you have just two squares. And then the story repeats. So just like in our coin tossing problem from one experiment to another, here, the number of these squares and circles, they will fluctuate between generations, even though they were equally fit, all of them equally fit, yet this number was going to change. So this is not natural selection, this is not mutation. This is this randomness. And this randomness has huge consequences, as I'll say in a minute. But let's just see that how do now our uh, dynamics of the frequency look like. So if I have a large population, so suppose I had 40% of the mutant population, then if I run this little program, it shows that, like I said already, this frequency is going to fluctuate. It's not you know, increasing smoothly like I showed you earlier. It goes up and down, up and down, just like we saw in experiments. And in all of these stochastic trajectories, the mutant spreads through the population. It reaches a frequency one in a finite time, which is consistent with our intuition. However, when 
the mutant is present in small numbers, just like our coin tossing problem, they are subject to larger fluctuations. In some stochastic trajectories, the mutant can spread in the population, it can acquire a frequency of one, but by chance in some cases, maybe the mutant does not have any children, does not have any offspring, and therefore the population can die. This is a very important point, and so therefore let me just repeat that a bit. So let's repeat, when a new variant arises, even if a mutant is good, it's beneficial, it is not guaranteed to spread. Okay, so that is the first important consequence of randomness. It's not guaranteed to spread, it can get lost. Okay, similarly, a bad mutant can spread. You would have thought that it's a bad mutant, it's not good, it should go away, but no, it can spread. Okay, so these are very nice results which have been uh, known for at least 50 years. And they have some consequences, and I'll say that very briefly. Because a good mutant can get lost, a consequence of that is that the adaptation speed slows down because there are a waste of good mutations. Mutant arose, but you know, it just got lost. So therefore, the adaptation, the evolutionary process got slowed down. And this similar idea, sort of this idea actually also plays out in a more complex settings, more complex models. So where the good mutations start to compete with each other. So for example, there's a pink mutation which came in and it was happily, it escaped randomness loss and it started to march up, but oops, a slightly better one came along because of which this one dies out. In other words, the chance that this could spread is reduced considerably. And therefore there's a waste of beneficial mutations. The Lensky experiment that I showed you, this slowing down is partly explained by this waste of good mutations, okay? Similarly, for bad mutations also, there's a consequence that because they can spread. And in fact, there's a recent proposal to uh, combat the coronavirus pandemic, the current pandemic. So the idea there is that you see that um, if we can uh, uh, increase the mutation rate of the virus, and it is possible to do that using certain drugs. So if you can do that, then lots of mutations are happening very, very fast, lots and lots and lots of them. It takes time for the population to purge them, to take them out because it's bad for it. But there are lots of them are coming. And before population can take them out, they have already got, have, have sort of spread into it. But if they have bad mutations, then the virus is not good. It's not viable. That means its population would decrease which means it will have more fluctuations. And then it may be possible that it can be therefore driven to extinction. So this is a sort of idea which is coming from this kind of theories. And there are some experiments, but I don't know whether, you know, uh, what's the uh, idea of the medical community on this. Okay, fine. So this is so far, I talked about experiments and so on. Um, uh, but how do we study that? So I'm a theoretician. How do I study it? I don't do experiments. So what do we what, what do we do? So these kind of problems are studied using what is called what's the stochastic process? It's simply a random variable. That means something which fluctuates. Okay, like the, uh, the whether we get head or tail. So the outcome of our coin toss that's a random variable. It could be head or a tail, right? So if a random variable is changing with time, that's described by this theory of stochastic processes. And what one does is to write down certain stochastic differential equations or partial differential equations to understand the properties of this stochastic process. For evolution, the problem that we are looking at, this frequency is fluctuating, right? It's a random variable. This defines the stochastic process and we are, are interested in at least two basic questions. First is that if I have, suppose, a good mutant, what is the chance that it would spread? Because you see, um, it didn't spread in all possibility, uh, in all trajectories. So the chance it spreads in this example is two by three, right? So what we want to understand is this is more general. Secondly, how much time would it take to spread? Would it take 
one year if uh, our coronavirus gets some good mutation which is good for it that is would it take one year or would it uh, spread in one day so these are very pertinent questions that one would like to ask and address so in my group we uh, we use this theory of stochastic processes to understand certain theoretical models of evolution and one of the things that we are very keen on doing is to take the simple models but try to make them as realistic as possible but keeping some of the simplicity because we would like to you know break it apart and understand each part of it thoroughly and so on the usual sort of reductionist approach of a physicist so that's what we try to do and one of the things that i'm trying to do these days i'm interested and excited about is to understand how evolution happens when the environment is changing continually right so we know that the you know environment changes all the time so it can happen at different scales so for example here what is shown is the uh, in some units and so on the earth's temperature so it's roughly constant of course there's some jiggling around some constant and then later on in the 1960s it has been increasing almost linearly with time again with some jiggings right so there could be such predictable trends like this linear increase there could be some random trends like this jiggling the changes could be on the scale of tens of years they could be on the scale of seasons which is a year or of course any changes so we would like to understand the effect of these changes on dynamics of evolution so for today i am going to focus only on the effect of seasonal cycles and i'll just tell you very briefly what we do so the kind of question that we have in mind is let's suppose uh, it's summer very nice and the mutant is coming and uh, this uh, mu is a favorable mutant uh, in summer that means the, the, this mutation is good when the environment is uh, uh, when the season is summer okay so that frequency of it as you expect would increase with time but the same mutant it is disfavored it becomes a bad mutant in winter so when winter came then the frequency of the mutant started to decrease nearing the extinction it's almost there to get extinct but somehow because of chance it recovers perhaps and again good times are back and again it increases and so on it fluctuates fluctuates and in this example it happens to spread in spite of the fact that the uh, environment was changing so we would like to understand this question that what's the chance that in this changing environment a uh, mutant would spread and how much time would it take so i'll just give you the answers so this is the work with my phd student archana devi so what she found is that there are situations in which if the chance that the mutant spreads in a constant environment is given by these this line that can reduce a lot by almost an order of magnitude almost a tenth it can become if the environment is changing continually if it is changing rapidly enough similarly if a mutant has such a low chance of spreading it could also increase a lot by almost two orders of magnitude so you know depending upon uh, various parameters in the model she has been able to find certain formulas for it second question i asked was what's the time it takes Uh, for the new variant to spread in the population so this was slightly technical but it's a nice answer so i will just tell you anyway so you see um there is a, a, a so it's a sort of counterintuitive result and it comes from math so the result is that if the environment is constant then if a mutant has 10% advantage it takes the same time to spread as the one with 10% disadvantage okay so there's a slightly technical thing which i haven't told you but it's a counterintuitive result and it's true and it's used to figure out which sites in the genome are under selection but because of the symmetry it's hard to know whether or not this mutant is a good mutant or a bad mutant that means we cannot figure out the sign of selection okay whether it's a positive selection or negative selection but my phd student sachin koshik he has found that if environment is changing then this result does not hold any longer and we believe that 
this can potentially allow us to distinguish between positive and negative selection. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so um, I mean, so I just told you a little bit about our work and uh, in changing environments. And of course, it's a no brainer. Of course, if the environment changes, results would change. They would be different from uh, what you would get if the environment was not changing. But modeling, a theoretical modeling, a mathematical modeling allows you to find quantitative estimate of these changes. So that is why what we do with theory allows us to put numbers on things, to get some simple formulas, which can play a role in further development of experiments, to testing predictions and so on. Okay. So I think I'm out of time and I am basically done. So I just have a simple three lessons, if you like, for you. First of all, evolution is observable. Of course, not always. As I said, for the moth example, selection pressure has to be sufficiently high. And they are not just moth or the Lenski experiment. There are now a large number of very well-documented well examples of evolution in action. And I strongly encourage you to have a look at some of them. There are nice books and uh, review articles to read. The second point that I started to try to make here is that evolution is a largely stochastic process. We should not know stochasticity. And it's especially important when the new variant arises, which is again, as I said, you have been reading every day in the news. But we should view evolution, not just through the lens, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the usual magnifying lens, but I would like to say, view it through the lens of a rule view. That means include stochasticity. It could help. And stochasticity is not important just only in evolution. It plays a role in physics, chemistry, biology, finance, and so on. Unfortunately, in our education system, it is probability is not taught much. We don't learn much. But I tell you, this plays an important role in all branches of science. So, you know, why not take the initiative and learn a little bit about it? It could help you with your research and, you know, what you want to do later on. Okay, so I think I can stop here. Anupma, I'm done. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Kavita. That was uh, very insightful because uh, coming from a biology background, it really kind of, you know, uh, helps you actually uh, put forth all the models which you end up teaching in theory. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, interesting questions both on YouTube and on the question answer section. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, you know lovely insights and we'll begin with the questions so i'll try i'll try and take as many as possible so that uh, we are good to go uh, so the first one is uh, a, a very interesting question uh, where, which talks about the graph that you had used it says uh, in the graph of the black moth uh, you know the level of the black moth fell after 2006 so what could be a possible explanation for that i think this is probably the only exception in here okay uh, but you see, Arabas are huge. Okay. So I don't know, but I mean, I would say Arabas are huge. That is all I, I can say. Okay. Okay. Uh, the second question that I'm taking here is, uh, you said you, you measured fitness of the, uh, you know, the culture that was used. So what criteria were used to measure the fitness? Let's talk about this one. So here the fitness is measured as the growth rate of the, of the mutants. So here, you know, there's a certain, you know, you have to play these things if you, if you are experimentalist biologist, you would know what I mean. And there are these two types. The ancestor is one color and the, the other darker one is the mutant. And what you do is a competition experiment. That means you put them together and let them compete out and see as a result of competition, what's the growth rate of each of them. And that's what this relative fitness is. It's the growth rate of the mutant population relative to the ancestor. So you see, these populations, they're going to grow exponentially. When things grow exponentially, it means they grow as x e to the power r t. So that r is the growth rate. Okay. So the growth rate ratio is not spotted as a fitness of the population. OK. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Kavita, this may be more like a personal interest. What was the specific reason for you to select E. coli for uh, this study? Ah, so this one is, uh, no, no, so this, uh, this is a good question actually. So the E. coli, I mean, uh, was chosen simply because it replicates faster. In just 20 minutes, you get congeneration. Whereas for moths, it takes several weeks and several months. So you can get lots and lots of data. 
okay. in just a few years. So that was like, but that was one of the main reasons. For it. Okay. Uh, another interesting question is, uh, how would you define a stochastic trajectory? What is, according to you, a stochastic trajectory? Okay, so it's not the underlying model, which I have not told you. So I drew something right here. So it's not simply I drew the hand. There is a model, so as you can try to answer this question. So here is this sort of model here, which says that, you know, you have these two organisms and you, drive, you toss a coin, kill one of them, and then you plot these numbers as a function of time. That's how I'm generating this to pass it again. But is a standard model in the subject called okay. the right Fisher model. So if you search in Google for right Fisher process, I think you will uh, get, you can basically simulate them on your computer. Okay. Okay. Here is another interesting one. Uh, can stochastic models be made on the coronavirus mutations and yes. can these models be used to make futuristic uh, vaccines for tentative mutants? Okay, so this, uh, you know, uh, this coronavirus question is extremely difficult. They are extremely very, very difficult uh, things to handle. But just two days ago, I was reading a paper in which, you know, very similar things are seen in, again, some sort of realistic simulations. How it connects to vaccine, I can't say. But I already gave you one example. Yeah. That is, you know, if you simulate a virus, in fact, this is a simulation of the virus. We have taken realistic parameters for the, uh, for the coronavirus, and then they have proposed that how they can increase the, what is called the recombination rate, okay. and increase the mutation rate, which can potentially make it go extinct. So if you're interested more in that, maybe you should have a look at these two papers. Okay. Uh, there is, Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that. This is a more technical question, uh, Professor Jain. Uh, can we calculate all the parameters like loss of good mutations using probability calculations? Is there a possibility? Yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, when you have a model, you have parameters going in also. So things like mutation rates are going in, in the, in the, in the model. The population size is going in, selection strength is going in, in the model. And then what you can predict is for example the fitness curve. So again, let me give you an example over here. Yeah. So in this let's see experiment, for example, these you know the points are from the experiment, and they measure some of the parameters in the parameters from experiment. And this green curve and the red curve are chains. You have to add things to your model and uh, you know parameters into the model and use some such model and see if it works. I'm not sure if I completely uh, answered your question, but you know, if you guys have more questions, you're free to write to me uh, yeah. at my email. So I think, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, there's another interesting one here. Uh, when new variants are surviving, what is the fate of the original population? Okay. So if that, uh, that can go extinct, or it can also coexist in small numbers. For example, you would say, that, you know, um, there's a lichen, so there is only the white moth. So why didn't the dark moth go away? It's quite existing, yeah. but in small numbers. So both are possible. Okay. Uh, another one here. Uh, are there any barriers to evolution? Uh, yes, um, there are. It can, it can slow down a lot. So, for example, if the population size is very large, it can slow down. So it's not... I mean, it's not stopped, okay. but it can slow down a lot. Okay. So things like this interference, so because uh, it was so that you know this mutation yeah. is going, yeah. and another one comes along. These things happen when the population size is large. Large populations actually impede, can impede evolution process. It can slow down a lot. Okay. Uh, you mentioned an interesting uh, attribute during your talk uh, where you said, you know, 10% advantages and 10% disadvantages mutations. So uh, how are these qualitative mutations quantified? How do you quantify and what are the factors that are taken into consideration? Exactly. So this one, for example, it's coming from, uh, you know, so the 10% I simply took examples from the moth, for example, right? So this you can see, the survival fraction is 0.8 versus 0.7, right? So that's the 0.1 disadvantage of 
we do this kind of we well, means not I, I am not teaching. But these kind of experiments that tell you how to relate it to the advantage of the system. Similarly, over here also you can fix some curves, and that can also tell you what the selection advantage of the system is. Okay. Uh, this stochastic trajectory, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of, uh, is is being followed by small small point mutations uh, in small populations. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the stochastic trajectory it, would it would it follow uh, in small point mutations in small populations? Would would stochastic trajectory would you know still follow there in small populations if the population is not large? Yeah. No, that is the whole point. That the plasticity is actually there for any finite population. Okay. If it, it reduces as the population becomes larger. So here is much more stochastic than over here. So okay. small populations are stochastic. Okay. Uh, uh, what uh, would you be able to help us with? What types of software could be used for modeling the mutants? Any um, suggestions from your desk here? I don't use any software as such. I just write programs and uh, some softwares like Mathematica, for example. But I mean, what will you run on your mutants, or what will you run in Mathematica? Okay. If you are a first mathematician, you have to have grounding example. For example, if you have a stochastic process, first you have your model, then you can put it in your uh, First thing to start it, the question that you want to address, okay. what is your model, and then you run it in uh, whatever software. Okay. Uh... Fine, I think uh, there's just one more interesting question here. Uh, it says the individuals who are selected by randomness may or may not fit that particular habitat. Okay, uh, what is the fate of evolution uh, in, you know, in cases like that because of randomness? Yeah, so, 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 so if they don't fit in that environment, then we would say that they are built with their bad mutants. If they fit into that environment, then they are selected for. And for those ones, so, so the point is this, so if they fit in the environment, that means they're selected for, you expect them to spread, okay. but still, because of randomness, they may or may not, there's only a chance that they would spread. Okay, okay. Um, one last question here, it's more, uh, you know, asking uh, suggestions from you. Uh, could you suggest good books on evolution for students uh, to read at this moment or which could, you know, be easily accessible yeah. for them in an online mode, yeah? That would really help because that would help them to read further. Yeah. So, uh, so if you want to start, I mean, uh, sort of non-technical, there are several of them. So this person, Miles, I think he has a book, but I, I although I confess I have not read it myself. Okay. Uh, there is a book about called the book of the book. So I said there are several examples of evolution traction. One of them is about how finches, which live on the Galapagos Islands, how they evolved because of the selection pressures on the island. And it's by these two very eminent biologists, a grant and grant. I mean, the book is written by somebody else, but the experiments are by grant. Let's go the book. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, now this is uh, more like uh, a personal question which even I would uh, want to, you know, ask you. Now, you're a theoretical physicist by training. So, you know, what really got you interested in studying biological evolution? You know, we have these tight compartments which are there in universities and a lot of uh, academic uh, in academia. So, you know, what, what, what got you interested? What was your uh, story? What's the journey? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so tell you the truth, I like physics. I like math. Uh, so I wasn't really interested in biology, but it's just, I think, a matter of exposure. I wasn't really introduced to these uh, questions, these topics. So when I went after my PhD for a postdoc in Germany, I was introduced to these And then they looked interesting enough. So initially when we worked, we sort of, you know, did it like as a physicist with quite a address. But slowly I started to interact more with biologists and I found that there are very interesting questions that, to which I can contribute. So I would say I slowly, uh, you know, uh, try to learn more about it, and uh, I guess that's about it.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jain, for taking so many questions. And I think uh, we are still having a lot of questions coming in, but we will, uh, uh, you know, try directly address them to you and send over the answers. Thank you so much for, uh, you know, uh, the wonderful talk. And uh, this is for all the participants who are there on the various uh, channels watching our session today. Uh, a link for the feedback has been put in the chat window as, as well as in the chat of the YouTube section. So please be kind enough to fill the feedback uh, uh, form and uh, please do uh, you know write your uh, the spelling of your name correctly for us to you know to help us to generate the certificate also uh, this is to tell you that please uh, you know uh, remain connected with us on uh, our different social media handles where announcements are regularly made for all the sessions uh, of the data science webinar series the upcoming sessions the next session is uh, going to be held on 3rd June 2021, which is going to be addressed by Dr. Debarka Sen Gupta, who is from the Indraprastha Institute of Information Technology, just to give you a quick overview of uh, all the sessions that are there in June. So on 3rd June, I just announced. On 10th June, we have Dr. Lippi Tukral from CSIR IGIB. On the 17th June, we have Dr. Swapnil Rani from Tata Memorial um, TMC. On the 24th June, we have Dr. Mohit Kumar Jolly from the Indian Institute of Science. So uh, for all those who are attending this online, and uh, thank you very much uh, for such a lovely participation. And I think it's the questions which really, uh, you know, help knit the session and take it forward. And it also kind of uh, helps us at Manav Initiative to understand what are the kind of questions that you're looking for, what are the answers that you're seeking. And as students, what uh, what is the kind of information that you would like to uh, get from our desk? So. Uh, with this, uh, putting in a request again for uh, all of you to kindly fill in the uh, feedback form, the link of which has been provided in the uh, chat window here and also on YouTube. And uh, another important uh, point that I would like to mention here is that in case you've missed out any of the sessions uh, that we've had till now, recordings of all the sessions are available on YouTube. So you could uh, easily access the Manav uh, YouTube uh, uh, channel and uh, could you know, uh, hear those sessions out. So thank you once again on behalf of the entire uh, Manav Human Atlas Initiative team uh, back end for all the logistic support and uh, for such a wonderful uh, uh, talk, uh, Dr. Uh, Jen. And I'd like to thank my entire team for all the support for putting this session together. And uh, thank you to the audience for your uh, really interactive participation that really means so much to the Manav team. So on behalf of the entire team, I'd like to take leave of all of you. And any questions that still uh, remain with us in the chat window, Dr. Chen, we will definitely be uh, addressing them to you. And uh, for all the participants, you will all be getting a participation certificate. So please do not forget to fill in the feedback form that has been provided as a link. So thank you very much, ma'am. And thank you very much to the audience on behalf of my entire team. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, bye.